Our text for the morning is found in Matthew 6. You're all familiar with this passage, I suspect. Matthew 6, verse 31 to 34. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or how shall we be clothed? For all, after all these do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Maybe it's a cooler temperature uh, or a little more awake in the morning. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you. And um, yes, it, <laughs> I'm not back 100%, but definitely better. I pray my voice holds up through the service. But other than that, uh, doing much better. In case you wondered, no, it was not COVID. <laughs> yeah, they think it was probably viral pneumonia, but uh, I'm doing better and long past anything contagious. So it's wonderful to be back with you. I would like to thank Dr. Luke for his uh, Johnny on the spot, stepping in for, for me and helping out and others. So. And really want to appreciate all your prayers. Uh, I could feel it um, and definitely appreciate that. And, and the cards and, and the well wishes. Just thank you so much. It's wonderful to be part of a church family. Amen? Amen. Part of the family of God. The other thing I want to mention, and uh, Dr. Mark brought it up. You've already seen the little handout cards back with the bulletins. But I also have a number of these um, that you can take with you. They'll be in the back. So I really encourage you to take a few with you and put them in the car, um, hand them out to anybody. You never know. The, the meetings start Wednesday evening, this coming Wednesday, and the 19th at 7 o'clock right here. And I think you will be blessed by it. And all those who can come to start uh, understanding the Bible truths and, and why we need to be grounded in that. With these days coming, people are starting to search. So take a few of these. Um, I'm going to go around and hit eight or nine houses right around where we live and, um, you know, hand them out, the grocery clerk, um, the gas station attendant. And you just never know. Just, just take them with you because God is at work. Amen? Amen? We need to be faithful Amen. and he brings the results. Amen. And so we'll, we'll leave it for that. So I've got quite a few of these. So don't be bashful. We want you to take them with you. So good. Okay, uh, if we may, let's, let's bow our heads again before we start. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you, our Creator, our Redeemer, the Sovereign God of the entire creation. We are humbled by the fact that you take note of us, that you would come down to lift us up out of the sin that we are in and wants to restore us to that heavenly place because of Jesus and what he's done for us. So Lord, we ask that your spirit would touch my words and thoughts today and, and our hearts, all of us, Lord, that we may go from here contemplating and rejoicing both in thy goodness. For we know that you are with us. We thank you for that, and we pray that you will guide us every step of the way. In thy name, amen. Well, friends, right out of the start here, a confession. As I was considering the, what I wanted to talk with about this morning, I went back and was doing some research um, into the spirit of prophecy. There was a story in here that I wanted to, to touch on, and that's the story of the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. The story, you know it, of Cestius, you know, the, the, the 
guy who first sieged Jerusalem and then withdrew and then Titus came and, and the whole destruction story. And I struggled and struggled to try to figure a way to shorten that. And I couldn't. So if you give me a little grace, I would like to read from the great controversy as she expounds and unfolds she wrote, but even within the great controversy on this subject, she's drawing from Josephus. She's drawn from a fellow named Milman in the history of the Jews, plus what God had revealed to her. So it is a very accurate and a very complete thing of that time. And bear with me clear to the end, not just to the story, because we are going to go somewhere with this. So if I may, this is starting on page 25. Jesus declared to the listening disciples the judgments that were to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly, and the Savior warned his followers, <clears throat> quote, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extends some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning signs should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Throughout the land of Judea, as well as in Jerusalem itself, the signal for flight must be immediately obeyed. He who chanced to be upon the housetop must not go down into his house, even to save his most valued treasures. Those who were working in the fields or vineyards must not take time to return for the outer garment that was laid aside while they should be toiling in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate a moment, lest they be involved in the general destruction. In the reign of Herod, Jerusalem had not only been greatly beautified, but by the erection of towers and walls and fortresses, adding to the natural strength of its situation, it had been rendered apparently impregnable. He who would at this time have foretold publicly its destruction would, like Noah in his day, have been called a crazed alarmist. But Christ had said, heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. Because of her sins, wrath had been denounced against Jerusalem, and her stubborn unbelief rendered her doom certain. For nearly 40 years after the doom of Jerusalem had been pronounced by Christ himself, the Lord delayed his judgments upon the city and the nation. Wonderful was the long-suffering of God towards the rejectors of his gospel and the murderers of his son. The parable of the unfruitful tree represented God's dealings with the Jewish nation. The command had gone forth, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? But divine mercy spared it yet a little longer. There were still many among the Jews who were ignorant of the character and the work of Christ. And the children had not enjoyed the opportunities or received the light which their parents had spurned. Through the preaching of the apostles and their associates, God would cause light to shine upon them, and they would be permitted to see how prophecy had been fulfilled not only in the birth and life of Christ, but in his death and resurrection. The children were not condemned for the sins of the parents, but when, with the knowledge of all the light given to their parents, the children rejected the additional light granted to themselves, they became partakers of the parents' sins and filled up the measure of their iniquity. The long-suffering of God towards Jerusalem only confirmed the Jews in their stubborn impenitence. In their hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus, they rejected the last offer of mercy. Then God withdrew his protection from them and removed his restraining power from Satan and his angels, and the nation was left to the control of the leader that she had chosen. Her children had spurned the grace of Christ which would have enabled them to subdue their evil impulses, and now these became the conquerors. Satan aroused the fiercest and most debased passions of the soul. Men did not reason. They were beyond reason, 
controlled by impulse and blind rage. They became satanic in their cruelty. In the family and in the nation, among the highest and the lowest classes alike, there was suspicion and envy, hatred, strife, rebellion, and murder. There was no safety anywhere. Friends and kindred betrayed one another. Parents slew their children and children their parents. The rulers of the people had no power to rule themselves. Uncontrolled passions made them tyrants. The Jews had accepted false testimony to condemn the innocent Son of God, and now false accusations made their own lives uncertain. By their actions, they had long been saying, Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And now their desire was granted. The fear of God no longer disturbed them. Satan was at the head of the nation, and the highest civil and religious authorities were under his sway. The leaders of the opposing factions at times united to plunder and torture their wretched victims, and again they fell upon each other with forces and slaughtered without mercy. Even the sanctity of the temple could not restrain their horrible ferocity. The worshippers were stricken down before the altar. The sanctuary was polluted with the bodies of the slain. Yet in their blind and blasphemous presumption, the instigators of this hellish work publicly declared that they had no fear that Jerusalem would be destroyed, for it was God's own city. To establish their power more firmly, they bribed false prophets to proclaim, even while Roman legions were besieging the temple, that the people were to wait for the deliverance from God. To the last, multitudes held fast to the belief that the Most High would interpose for the defeat of their adversaries. But Israel had spurned the divine protection, and now she had no defense. O oh, unhappy Jerusalem, rent by internal dissensions, the blood of her children slain by one another's hands, crimsoning her streets, while alien armies beat down her fortifications and slew her men of war. All the predictions given by Christ concerning the destruction of Jerusalem were fulfilled to the letter. The Jews experienced the truth of his words of warning, quote, With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. This was interesting. In the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministering by night in the sanctuary were terrified by mysterious sounds. The earth trembled, and a multitude of voices were heard crying, Let us depart hence. The great eastern gate, which is so heavy it could be hardly shut by a score of men, and which was secured by immense bars of iron fastened deep in the pavement of solid stone, opened at midnight without any visible agency. For seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and night, he chanted the wild dirge, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged, but no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse, he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning cry ceased not only, excuse me, his warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege that he had foretold. Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning, and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the des desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Close quote. After the Romans under Cestius had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. The besieged, despairing of successful resistance, were on, who were on the point of surrender, 
when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his own people. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was afforded for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews, sallying from Jerusalem, pursued after his retiring army, and while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christians had an opportunity to leave the city. At this time, the country also had been cleared of enemies who might have endeavored to intercept them. And at the time of the siege, the Jews were assembled at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and thus the Christians throughout the land were able to make their escape unmolested. Without delay, they fled to a place of safety, the city of Pella, in the land of Perea, beyond Jordan. The Jewish forces, pursuing after Cestius and his army, fell upon their rear with such fierceness as to threaten them with total destruction. It was with great difficulty that the Romans succeeded in making their retreat, for the Jews escaped almost without loss, and with their spoils they returned in triumph to Jerusalem. Yet this apparent success brought them only evil. It inspired them that the spirit of stubborn resistance to the Romans, which speedily brought unutterable woe upon the doomed city. Terrible were the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. The city was invested at the time of the Passover when millions of Jews were assembled within its walls. Their stores of provision, which if carefully preserved, would have supplied the inhabitants for years, had previously been destroyed through the jealousy and revenge of the contending factions. And now all the horrors of starvation were experienced. A measure of wheat was sold for a talent. So fierce were the pangs of hunger, men would gnaw the leather of their belts and sandals and the covering of their shields. Great numbers of people would steal out at night to gather wild plants growing outside the city walls, though many were seized and put to death with cruel torture, and often those who returned in safety were robbed of what they had been gleaning at so great a peril. The most inhumane tortures were inflicted by those in power to force from the want-stricken people the least scanty supplies which they might, might, might have concealed. And these cruelties were not infrequently practiced by men who were themselves well-fed and who were merely desiring to lay up a store of provision for their future. Thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affection seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands robbed their wives and wives of their husbands. Children would be seen snatching food from the mouths of their aged parents. The question of the prophet, can a woman forget her sucking child, received the answer within the walls of that doomed city. Quote, the hands of the pitiful woman who have sodden their own children, for they were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. Close quote. Again was fulfilled the warning prophecy given 14 centuries before. Quote, the tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil towards the husband of her bosom and towards her son and her daughter and toward her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates." The Roman leaders endeavored to strike terror to the Jews and cause them to surrender. Those prisoners who resisted when taken were scourged, tortured, and crucified before the wall of the city. Hundreds were daily put to death in this manner. And the dreadful work continued until all along the valley of Jehoshaphat and at Calvary, crosses were erected in so great numbers there was scarcely room to move among them. So terrible was visited that awful imprecation uttered before the judgment seat of Pilate, his blood be on us and on our children. Titus would willingly have put an end to the fearful scene and spared Jerusalem the full measure of her doom. He was filled with horror as he saw the bodies of the dead lying in heaps in the valleys. Like one entranced, he looked down from the crest of Olivet upon the magnificent temple and gave the command that not one stone of it be touched. 
before attempting to gain possession of this stronghold, he made an earnest appeal to the Jewish leaders not to force him to defile the sacred place with blood. This was the enemy. If they would come forth and fight in any other place, no Roman should violate the sanctity of the temple. Josephus himself, in a most eloquent appeal, entreated them to surrender to save themselves, their city, and their place of worship. But his words were answered with bitter curses. Darts were hurled at him. That was an old name for spears. Their last human mediator, as he stood pleading with them, for the Jews had rejected the entreaties of the Son of God. And now expulsion and entreaty only made them more determined to resist the last. In vain were the efforts of Titus to save the temple. One greater than he had declared that not one stone was to be left upon another. The blind obstinacy of the Jewish leaders and the, and the detestable crimes perpetrated within the besieged city excited the horror and the indignation of the Romans, and Titus at last decided to take the temple by storm. He determined, however, that if possible it should be saved from destruction, but his commands were disregarded. After he had retired to his tent at night, the Jews, coming out of the temple, attacked the soldiers out without. In the struggle, a firebrand was flung by a soldier through an opening in the porch, and immediately the cedar-lined chambers about the holy house were in a blaze. Titus rushed to the place, followed by his generals and legionnaires, and commanded the soldiers to quench the flames. But his words were unheeded. In their fury, the soldiers hurled blazing brands into the chambers adjoining the temple, and then with their swords, they slaughtered in great numbers those who were found sheltering there. Blood flowed down the temple steps like water. Thousands upon thousands of Jews perished. Above the sound of the battle, voices were heard shouting, Ichabod, meaning the glory is departed. Quote, Titus found it impossible to check the rage of the soldiery. He entered with his officers and surveyed the interior of the sacred edifice. The splendor filled them with wonder. And as the flames had not yet penetrated the holy place, he made a last effort to save it. And springing forth, again exhorted the soldiers to stay the progress of the conflagration. The centurion liberalis endeavored to force obedience with his staff of office. But even respect for the emperor gave way to the furious animosity against the Jews. To the fierce excitement of battle and to the insatiable hope of plunder, the soldiers saw everything around them radiant with gold, which shone dazzlingly in the wild light of the flames. They supposed that incalculable treasures were laid up in the sanctuary. A soldier, unperceived, thrust a lighted torch between the hinges of the door, and the whole, blame, the whole building was in flames in an instant. The blinding smoke and fire forced the officers to retreat, and the noble edifice was left to its fate. It was an appalling spectacle to the Roman. What was it to the Jew? The whole summit of the hill which commanded the city blazed like a volcano. One after another, the buildings fell in with a tremendous crash and were swallowed up in the fiery abyss. The roofs of cedar were like sheets of flame. The gilded pinnacles shone like spikes of red light. The gate towers sent up tall columns of flame and smoke. The neighboring hills were lighted up, and dark groups of people were seen watching in horrible anxiety the progress of the destruction. The walls and the heights of the upper city were crowded with faces, some pale with agony of despair, others scowling, unavailing vengeance. The shouts of the Roman soldiery as they ran to and fro, and the howlings of the insurgents who were perishing in the flames, mingled with the roaring of the conflagration and the thundering sound of falling timbers. The echoes of the mountains replied or brought back the shrieks of the people on the heights. All along the walls resounded screams and wailings. Men who were expiring for famine rallied their remaining strength to utter a cry of anguish and desolation. The slaughter within was even more dreadful than the spectacle without. Men and women, old and young, insurgents and priests, those who fought and those who entreated mercy, were hewn down in indiscriminate carnage. The number of the slain exceeded that of the slayers. The legionnaires had to clamber over heaps of the dead to carry on the work of extermination. 
After the destruction of the temple, the whole city soon fell into the hands of the Romans. The leaders of the Jews forsook their impregnable towers, and Titus found them solitary. He gazed upon them with amazement and declared that God had given them into his hands, for no engines, however powerful, could have prevailed against those stupendous battlements. Both the city and the temple were raised to their foundations, and the ground upon which the holy house had stood was plowed like a field. In the siege and the slaughter that followed, more than a million of the people perished. Survivors were carried away as captives, sold as slaves, dragged to Rome to grace the conqueror's triumph, or thrown to wild beasts in the amphitheaters, or scattered as homeless wanderers throughout the earth. The Jews had forged their own fetters. They had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. In the utter destruction that befell them as a nation, and in all the woes that followed them in their dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown. Says the prophet, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. That's in Hosea 13. Their sufferings were often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. But it is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering in holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against the transgression. But he leaves the rejecters of his mercy to themselves to reap what they have sown. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner, and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. The destruction of Jerusalem is a fearful and solemn warning to all who are trifling with the offers of divine grace and resisting the pleadings of divine mercy. Never was there given a more decisive testimony to God's hatred of sin and to the certain punishment that will fall upon the guilty. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment of which that terrible desolation is but a faint shadow. That's a serious sentence, isn't it? Considering what we just heard, that is just a faint shadow as to what is going to come upon the world. In the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy and trampled upon his law. Dark are the records of human misery that earth has witnessed during his long centuries of crime. The heart sickens and the mind grows faint in contemplation. Terrible have been the results of rejecting the authority of heaven, but a scene yet darker is presented in the revelations of the future. The records of the past, the long procession of tumults, conflicts, and revolutions, the battle of the warrior with confused noise and garments roiled in blood, what are these in contrast with the terrors of that day when the restraining spirit of God shall wholly be withdrawn from the wicked, no longer to hold in check the outburst of human passion and satanic wrath? The world will then behold as never before the results of Satan's rule. 
But in that day, as in the time of Jerusalem's destruction, God's people will be delivered. Say amen. Amen. Christ has declared that he will come the second time to gather his faithful ones to himself. Quote, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Close quote. Then shall they that obey not the gospel be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and be destroyed in the brightness of his coming. Like Israel of old, the wicked destroy themselves. They fall by their own iniquity. By a life of sin, they have placed themselves so out of harmony with God, their natures have become so debased with evil that the manifestation of his glory is to them a consuming fire. Let men beware lest they neglect the lesson conveyed to them in the words of Christ. As he warned his disciples of Jerusalem's destruction, giving them a sign of the approaching ruin that they might make their escape, so he has warned the world of the day of final destruction and has given them tokens of its approach that all who will may flee from the wrath to come. Jesus declares, There shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations. Those who behold these harbingers of his coming are to know that it is near, even at the doors. Watch ye therefore, are his words of admonition. They that heed the warning shall not be left in darkness, that the day should overtake them as unawares. But to them that will not watch, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The world is no more ready to credit the message for this time than were the Jews to receive the Savior's warning concerning Jerusalem. Come when it may, the day of God will come unawares to the ungodly. When life is going on its unvarying rounds, when men are absorbed by pleasure and business and traffic and money-making, when religious leaders are magnifying the world's progress and enlightenment and the people are lulled in a false security, then, as the midnight thief steals within the unguarded dwelling, so shall sudden destruction come upon the careless and ungodly, and they shall not escape. Solemn words. We think of that and hopefully we're horrified. But it caused me to pause and to consider the days we live in. That we too, like the Jews, stand at risk of being caught up in the everyday life and the assumption of our relationship with Jesus. To me, it, it's a call personally myself, and I hope to you too, to evaluate, are you ready? Is there something that we need to be ready for? You no, know, Matthew 24, 15 to 18, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Interesting words of Jesus. He's talking of Jerusalem. But remember, it's a parallel for our days. Luke 21 has a parallel passage. It says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them which are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Did you ever read that and wonder, well, if you're surrounded, how are you going to flee? Well, it's obviously they didn't see the army coming. I think it's no small point that this was not a foreign invading army. This was an occupying army. It came from within. As I read these things, consider the world today that we live in. Are there parallels? We know that when they woke up, they looked out and it had suddenly happened. They were surrounded. And how did they escape? We just heard the story. Cestius withdrew. 
And they had the opportunity to heed Jesus' warning to get out and to get out quickly. And those who didn't heed that warning, well, we read what happened. And I wonder, is there any relevance in this story for us? You know, can there be some lessons that we can learn? Because we know there's a crisis coming. And, and please, friends, I'm, I'm not trying to scare you. Neither was Jesus. He wants us to be aware. There is a way through. There is. And it reminded me of back in, uh, before the year 2000 hit. I think most of us here remember the Y2K, right? Um, yeah, it was, you know, the world was going to burn down, <laughs> so to speak. It, yeah, it, it was, I got an email. I'm sure you guys probably did some too. I got this email and I saved it. I, I, it crossed my mind as I was reading this. It said, I've been, quote, I've been looking around on the web for time to time and researching the Y2K issue. And yes, we have tremendous problems ahead. Should we even get to the year 2000? This was 1998. Some of the problems that are occurring in 1999 with the global positioning satellites and certain older programs that use the numbers 99 in their program to indicate the end of file. The most serious problem will be the potential loss of the power grid, which will shut many things down. It just shows us how little time we have left. The more I'm reading about the seriousness of the problem, the more I'm beginning to believe that Sunday laws will have been passed and probably probation will close before the year 2000. If I'm right, it will be no good to prepare for this Y2K crisis because the end of time will come first. There were those, I knew some, who believed that wholeheartedly. It reminded me of 1844 you know, also. But... You know, we think of Second Peter 3, 4 says, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You kind of get that feeling today. In some ways, there's an element of life is going on as usual. And yet, there's a whole lot of things going on that are stupendous. Many people prepared for the Y2K thing, the hard times that didn't come. Now, may I add quickly, part of why some of it didn't come out the way it is because thousands of people went to work on those programs, kept it from happening. There was issues with, with it. I don't know to what degree, but it definitely held it back. The reason we didn't see it is because they addressed it. There are people who think, you know, well, I was fooled then, so don't bother me about this time now. You know, the old Scottish proverb of fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. So they say, I don't care what Revelation 13 says. I'm not going to prepare for hard times. You know, it's Revelation 13, 16 and 17. It says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I'm not going to get into a study on that right now. But that sounds like tough times are ahead for us, right? For God's people. Yes, there are times that are coming. So the question, shall we restock our white 2 k provisions? You know, um, fool me twice, shame on me. If you knew the seven years of famine were coming, what would you do? Start to prepare. Think of Joseph, right? Joseph stored up provisions. Then why shouldn't we make provisions for the time when no man can buy or sell? What did Jesus say about making provisions for hard times? Remember? I just read Matthew 24, 17. You know, well, we might think like, uh, well, let him which is on the housetop come down to grab the provisions real quickly that he had stored up. Take him out of the house and let him that's on the field run back and grab his clothes and his camping gear. You know, we kind of think that way. And yet Matthew 24, 17 says, let him which is on the housetop not come down, right? It says not come down to take anything out of his house. Well, then maybe I would have stored my backpack and my dried food up on the roof. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's our, our mental thought. But did you ever wonder at this time, what did they do, jump off the roof? <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of, 
I, I don't know. With that 45 extra seconds to run down the stairs and grab something and before you head out the, of the walls have caused them to get captured? I don't know. Then why did Jesus say, don't take any provisions? Doesn't that seem a little irresponsible? I found this thought in Testimonies, Volume 1. that might, might give a little light on it. Um, Testimonies, yes, Volume 1, page 206. It says, the time of trouble is just before us. And then stern necessity will require the people of God to deny self and to eat merely enough to sustain life. But God will prepare us for that time. In that fearful hour, our necessity will be God's opportunity to impart his strengthening power and sustain his people. Close quote. Praise God. But God will prepare us for that time. Interesting sentence. How's he going to do that? By us signing up and taking wilderness survival courses and edible food classes? Wild plants? I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. It's good things to know. Or maybe it's by working in our hearts so we grow closer and closer to God in his character and our relationship, putting self aside and sin aside, allowing his power in our life so that we are in harmony with him when those days come. In that fearful hour, our necessities is God's opportunity to impart his strengthening power and to sustain his people. You want to be one of his people. Amen? Amen. Yes. God is looking forward, I believe, to the opportunity of himself sustaining us without any action on our part. For us to rely completely on him. He did it for Elijah. You think of it in 1 Kings 17. We won't read through the whole story here just because of time, but remember how Elijah was sent and ended up with his, met this lady who was on the last of her food. Remember the, the, the cake and, and the meal and the oil? She was gathering two sticks to build a little fire to make the last of her food so she and her son could eat and then die. And Elijah said, fear not, in verse 13. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me a little cake first and bring it to me, and after then for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Is God a God of ability? Amen. Depending. We can depend totally on him. Because it says in verse 16, the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord. Every time she went back, there was more. It never ran out. You see why Jesus said to leave it all behind and to trust him? You know, in the time of crisis that is before us, and yes, it's true, there is one before us. He wants us, I mean, he wants to be the sole provider for all of our temporal needs. Remember the training of the disciples? Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. When he's sending out the twelve. It says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, in verse 8, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse. By the way, the word scrip there, if you're like me, your mind wants to put a T on the end, script, and you think of paper money or something. Now, scrip is actually um, a bag that they wore often either on the belt or just thrown over their, their shoulder that they put food in and other things besides their purse where they kept their monies, except. So it says script. They're talking about don't take your extra bag. Don't take your backpack. 
but be shod with sandals, verse 9, and not put on two coats. Whoa, very detailed instructions heading out. You know, in Matthew 10, flip over to Matthew 10 here real quick. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 9. Matthew 10 verse 9, he says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. That covers it all, right? Verse 10, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor your staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Turn over to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Verse 35 and 36. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now ye hath purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Hmm. So Jesus is saying that there is a period of time where we do need to take an active part in taking care of ourselves. And there will be a period of time when we are to do nothing towards taking care of ourselves. So guess what period of time we're currently in? We're responsible, right? For supplying our food, our clothing, our security needs. In fact, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 reminds us very distinctly, says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves. We are to plan ahead. We are to make thoughtful preparations for our daily and our emergency needs. Proverbs 6, 6 to 8, we have learned as children, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be what? You know what? Be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. You know, the bees do the same thing, right? Ellen White, The Early Years, Volume 1, page 272, quote, It was Ellen White's philosophy that neither a family nor an individual should spend an entire income. A reserve, no matter how small, must always be kept for rainy day. In the Rochester home, with its large family to feed, she knew such a day would come. And from her allowance for maintaining the home, she astutely took out a few coins each week and slipped them into a stocking hidden behind a cupboard door in the kitchen. It was her secret, one she did not even share with James. So we know, yes, we need to prepare. We have things to do to take care of ourselves. But there will be a time when Jesus is going to provide everything. And during that time of trouble spoken of in Revelation, friend, let's remember not to worry about anything at that time. Did you know that even if you decide to put up goods, it won't do any good? Maranatha, page 120. Quote, for two years past, the Lord has shown me in vision, she says. So very specific. Repeatedly, that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up on by them or in the fields in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. The Lord has shown me that some of his children would fear when they see the price of food rising, and they would buy food and lay it up for the time of trouble. But then in the time of need, I saw them go to their food and look at it, and it had bred worms and was full of living creatures and not fit for use. Page 56, early writings. I saw our bread and water will be sure at that time, and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger, for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, 
he'll send ravens to feed us, as he did feed Elijah. Or he rained manna from heaven, as he did for the Israelites. Can't wait for a bird to come feed me. Maybe that's why we enjoy feeding the birds now. Remember this, you know. <laughs> Make our friends. Nah, God can do miraculous things, and he wants to. Okay, friends, so you may be thinking, what does all this have to do with us? It seems like you know, none of this is going to happen in our lifetime. Or is it? If you're alert to what is happening in our world, the changes that are going on, we see Bible prophecy coming true. Things I never thought I'd see, things happening right here in our own country. If you look at it and think of prophecy, friends, you can already see Titus army surrounding. One last quote from a periodical called The Broadside 2, January 31, 1849. Mrs. White says, quote, My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually. Let them crowd worldly thoughts and cares from the mind. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act wholly in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and soon will be over. Now is the time to make our calling and election sure. While the four angels are holding the four winds. Close quote. The more we study, the more we realize God is going to take care of us. He is going to take care of his people. His people have nothing to fear. We've read that today. Amen? We can see that because even though the world is falling apart around us, there are forces at work behind the scenes and in the front page of the scenes that are working and setting things up. Remember, the end day events will be rapid and will catch many unawares. That's why I wanted to talk about this this morning. I'm not trying to scare you. I want you to wake up and make sure you're awake. Maybe you already are. Maybe I, I'm wasting your time. But friends, the fire is coming. There are people like in Jerusalem that are inside that are not heeding the warnings. It's, you know, if you're in a house and it's on fire, the fireman doesn't come in and say, oh, you know, by the way, and don't let me offend you. I don't want to step on your toes or anything, but you know, really uh, it'd be good if you would just kind of make your way to the back door and get out. No, he comes and goes, fire! Get out! Don't you know? These are invitations to try to help people who may not be aware of what's about to break on the world to come and start learning more. The power of God is working. He wants everybody to get out while they can. But the time is short. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Let God speak to your heart. Personally, first and foremost. Your family, definitely. Anybody you may know or cross paths with, absolutely. God wants his people to be proclaimers of the message and to bring people for the opportunity. It's still their free choice. It's always their choice. It should always be their choice. God died for free choice. How dare we try to legislate morality or try to force people into things. Not God's way. But education, invitation, loving, Christ's method alone brings true success. 
we must be filled with his spirit and to touch our hearts for time is short. Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your promises. The promises of protecting your people. That no matter what comes our way, Lord, you are with us. You go through the fires of affliction with us. Even the trials that we encounter today, Lord, are there for our good to burnish away and to teach us to submit to thy will. Lord, that we ask for that. Do what needs to be done in each of our hearts and our lives. As only you know, we can't look at each other, Lord. We must just look to you and surrender to you that you may prepare us, as we just read today, for those times that are coming when Satan is going to test each and every one. Lord, but the sweet promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. It's up to us. It's our choice. I just pray, Lord, that each one of us that hears my voice will choose to follow you 100%. To let go of anything in our hearts and our lives that stand between us and you. Give us a deeper understanding of Bible truth and why we need to study it and learn it. For it is the word of God that shines in our path and prepares us for that time. So, Lord, bless us now. May we go as your people today forth. And I ask that your spirit would touch every heart that we hand these cards to. That there are people out there you're working on. Bring them across our paths. And Lord, may we not miss a heavenly appointment. And invite them. For it can be the start of their journey home. So Lord, thank you for hearing our prayers today. Empower us and grow us and protect us. We give all the honor and the glory to you, Lord, forevermore. And God's people say, Amen. Amen.